Gwen Dudley, and I live in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm the mom of an almost five-year-old boy, Luca. He's the light of my life. Um, I work for a mental health outpatient center, helping people with treatment-resistant depression, PTSD, anxiety, OCD, uh, various new disorders, and I'm in recovery. Today's actually my two year sobriety date. So it's perfect that I got to be on this podcast on this day because I'm just feeling the gratitude below. And, you know, I love what using my story does on social media, spreading awareness about mental health and various issues related to that because it's so important and the world needs it. I am very familiar with mental health struggles. Um, it's been a theme in my life since I was probably 12 or 13. It's heavy in my family. So my mom's side, there's a lot of depression and anxiety. I think there's some bipolar sprinkled in there. There are addiction issues in my family. And um, for me, I would say what kickstarted it was just a trauma that happened to me when I was 12 and everything took off from there. And it really spiraled fast. Um, you know, at that age, I think a lot of kids are going through hormonal issues. And it's kind of like that golden age where mental health stuff can kick off. And it's tough. It's tough to be that age and, um, you know, feel isolated, feel different. And the way that I grew up, there was just a lot of chaos. And that in and of itself was traumatic. And I ended up, the first time I went into a psych ward was actually when I was 13. And I ended up in a uh, behavioral modification school where I lived there for two years. And it's really for the kids that are troubled, kids with a lot of mental health issues. They just put them all together in one place and it's, it's wild. <laughs> the traumas in my life just kept compounding and I grew up in the era when medication was blossoming and everybody wanted to put you on an antidepressant or an ADHD medication and it didn't help. It, if anything, it made me worse at times. And I turned to drinking and substances to numb the pain because nothing else was working. Alcohol was big in my life for longer and then when alcohol became unmanageable and things, destructive things were happening more. And then I was introduced to amphetamines and I realized that it would help me to not black out. It was kind of finding this concoction of what can I use that's going to mitigate the consequences a little bit. And it seems like a great solution, but it actually just took me downhill faster. In 2017, I overdosed and it was terrifying. I didn't expect that to happen. I don't know that anybody does, even though you know the risk. Sometimes I hear people say, well, you know what you're doing. You know what you're getting yourself into. And I think that when people are in so much pain that they're using a substance to feel better and get outside of that darkness, they're not thinking necessarily about overdosing. They just want to escape the pain and feel better. And it's a chemical issue. It's a trauma issue. It's pain. Um, and I, I didn't think it would happen. So when it happened, I was really emotional. I felt like God gave me a second chance and it was right around the holidays and all i could think about was that i almost left my family with all this pain right before christmas and 
the other thought that came to me was I have to help people. There are all these people I want to help. And I wasn't helping anybody at that time. I was, I was a mess, but I knew there was something more that I needed to do. Um, yeah. So I met Duffy in 2016 and we were friends and we actually started dating not long after my overdose. I started going back to meetings and getting involved back in recovery again. And he was at a meeting and we started talking and got really close. And so most of the time that we were together, I was sober. I did have a relapse about six months into our relationship. I had a miscarriage and just went off so, yeah, I just fell off. Sorry, miscarriage, I was using pretty heavily, but for a short period of time. And I ended up going to rehab about a month after because I just knew I needed help and had people in the recovery program that had my back and encouraged me to go to treatment. and. The treatment center I went to was really helpful and I felt great again. And then a couple months after I got a treatment, I was pregnant again with my son. Duffy and I had a lot of time sober in our relationship and we built a really beautiful life together. We had our son and there was so much joy. He had a lot of unresolved trauma and mental health issues that he hadn't been addressing. And my dad actually passed away at the end of 2020, a cancer diagnosis that was very fast, um, that, you know, from start of diagnosis to when we lost him. And I was very depressed and Duffy was working multiple jobs and going to school. He worked as a peer support specialist for the health department. So he helped other addicts who were struggling that overdose and went to the ER, he would help them get into treatment. And he stayed very busy and wasn't taking care of himself and ended up relapsing. And for anybody who loves somebody in addiction, you know the hell that comes with that and wanting them to get sober, knowing you can't get them sober. Um, I think some people don't know that, but you can't make somebody get sober. If love could get somebody sober or reasoning or any amount of effort, I would have been successful in getting him sober. But that wasn't the case. And as somebody in recovery, I know that to be true, but you still feel so powerless when you're in the other seat. Um, and it was ugly and he was trying to stay sober. He would put a little bit of time together here and there. But at the end, he thought he wouldn't overdose. It was something we talked about a lot. We've lost a lot of friends to overdose. Obviously it's what he did for work. So it was in our faces all the time. And he didn't think he would. And he did. Um, and you know, I had lost my boyfriend before Duffy turned overdose as well. And so it was one of my biggest fears to lose Duffy to that. And um, it was my nightmare come true, right? Um, and we didn't expect it. Nobody did. Nobody does and fentanyl is just so powerful and it's laced into all drugs now. And so people think that they're impervious to overdose, but the chances are really high that it'll happen. And Duffy died, I fell apart. Initially, I... It's just coming to terms with the reality that you don't think you could ever handle. So a lot of times people say to me, I don't know how you do it. You're so strong. But when you don't have a choice and I have my son, so 
not gonna lie, there were times that I didn't want to be here without him. And because of my son, I felt like I had to stay here. And I'm glad that I did because we do have a beautiful life now, no matter how much we still miss him. <clears throat> what I did was reached out to people. So I didn't isolate. Isolation is one of the worst things you can do if you're struggling and it's hard to do anything, right? To shower, to eat food, to make your bed. But it's so important because the rewards are great. So every time I actually spoke to somebody and shared how I was feeling, I could do a little bit more. And so in recovery, one of the biggest sayings is one day at a time. And everything I learned in recovery is what helped me with my grief. So connecting to a higher power, having some kind of spiritual journey and exercise, meditation, getting in touch with healing, going to therapy. I decided to get with a trauma therapist and I've been seeing her almost every week since he passed, which was about three years ago. And she has helped me tremendously. And talking to other people who've lost their loved one, specifically to an overdose. And I think when you connect with somebody who has your type of loss, there's nothing more powerful than shared pain, especially when there's a common denominator. So for parents who lost their child, I don't know what that's like. I hope that I never do, but they get a lot of comfort in connecting. Um, and then honoring him in all these different ways, helping people, sharing our story. I started posting videos on TikTok. I didn't even know anything about TikTok. And I just wanted some kind of video editing software to make little montages of us. And I was like, oh my God, I could help people. And just got really vulnerable. And if you knew me before, I was not a vulnerable person. Um, the video that you all posted is probably the most vulnerable video I've made. And I just decided I was going to put it all out there because if it could help one person, it was worth it. In the beginning, I think for me, it was making a choice. Do I want to live or do I want to exist? And when I made the choice to live, I knew that it would be a fight. I knew that it would be a battle and I needed to arm myself with all the right tools and the right support because you can do it alone, period. So I decided that I wanted to keep living, not just being here, but living with some kind of joy. And I wanted to honor Duffy. I knew that he would not want me to lay down and give up. He was the most vivacious, dynamic human, and he helped so many people. And I realized that I could do the same and I could make his death have meaning. And I think for people struggling with grief, a lot of them find healing through purpose. When I decided that I wanted to live, I started journaling. I started doing therapy every week. I started reading books about grief. And I reached out to other people who were going through the same thing. I exercised, yoga was really helpful for me. It's one of the most healing types of exercise for trauma and PTSD specifically. And it's really hard to exercise when you're depressed. You gotta do it because it boosts your chemicals. And I had to get sober. At first I was numbing myself and I thought that it was manageable. And because I have this addiction history, I had to stop because it always spirals and I didn't want to put my son in jeopardy of being an orphan. And so this is my passion. And if anyone out there is struggling with the loss of a loved one, the loss of a loved one to addiction, if you have a loved one in your life who's alive and in the midst of addiction, that can be such an isolating experience and there's such a stigma around addiction that it's hard to talk to anybody about it. 
I'm here. Please reach out. I also started a grief group for substance related loss that meets on Zoom. And there are people from all over the country that are on it. I can give that link as well. I'm on Instagram as Gwen underscore recovery underscore love. I'm on TikTok as Guinevere1123. I'm on YouTube under Gwen Dudley. So you can reach out to me on any and that, and I'm happy to talk. I talk to people all the time, and it's important to have somebody that you can connect to, even if it's a stranger, because at the end of the day, I might be a stranger, but I know your pain, and we can heal together through that. Whether we know each other or not, we know each other.